É, boa tarde a todos. É, good evening. Welcome to the second edition of the Brazilian Meeting on Natural Polymers, EPNAT, Encontro Brasileiro, Encontro Brasileiro de Polímeros Naturais. This year, we go virtual bringing together entrepreneurs, undergrad and graduate students, postdocs and professors to discuss uh, emerge, emerging research challenges and strategies for different application of natural polymers. The second EPNAT is chaired by scholars from leading universities, such as University of Araraquara, University of São Paulo, USP Fizeia Pirassubunga Campus, University of Campinas, Unicamp, São Paulo State University, UNESP Araraquara, and the uh, Ilha Solteira campuses, Federal University of São Paulo, Unifesp Diadema campus, and the Federal University of Piauí. All regions of Brazil are represented and even from Latin American countries like Argentina and Colombia. We, ha we are nine participants eager to listen from top-notch speakers from all, all over the world. Each day, we will have six talks divided into, into two blocks, three talks each. Between the blocks from uh, 3.20 to 3.50 p.m. Brazilian time, three selected presentations from the, five selected presentations from the students and postdocs will be broadcast live. All presentations are available on our website. After each talk, we will have a few minutes for questions and answers. The speaker will then join a Google Meet from, for 15 minutes, and all participants are invited to join the discussions and ask, the, and ask further questions. Please engage. On behalf, of, on behalf of the organizing committee, we appreciate your attendance and wish you a wonderful event. Thank you for uh, coming to, to virtual conference, EPNAT. Gracias por, gracias por la gente que está de fuera. Muito obrigado aos brasileiros que estão conosco também para a segunda edição do, do EPNAT. We will start now the first period. Uh, it will be the medicine and pharmacy. I would like to, to invite the Dr. Su. Hyun Shin. The title of this, this letter is Micro Nano Engineering Biomaterials for Manufacturing Biomimetic Tissue and Biomedical Applications. Su Ryan Shin, PhD, is an assistant professor of medicine at the Brigham and Harvard Medical School, ATMS. He earns, uh, her interdisciplinary approach has earned her, her a growing international reputation for her work in nanomaterial science, regenerative, regenerative medicine, and biomedical uh, engineering. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Ryan Shin, to stay with us in Epinachi. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for introducing me, and I'm really appreciate to give me the opportunity to present my work. So let me share the screen of my slide. So can you see my slide or at full screen? Hello? Yes, yes, you can see. It's yeah. okay for us. Okay for, for you, right? Yes, yes, okay. Okay, nice. Good, good, good. So you see the old full screen. Okay, so today I wanna talking about how to you know engineer the biomaterial with nanoparticle and also to create a biomimetic tissue construct and each, each biomedical application. So, so first, uh, in, uh, in the tissue engineering field, in the biomanufacturing is an emerging strategy to create a functional tissue construct and then implant them into the uh, patient directly to establish and structure and function of the injured tissue. 
So there are many advantages of this biomanufacturing strategy, so which can allow for rapid reproducible production with clinically relevant dimension. Also, we can fabricate, customize the tissue construct, which can fit to injured area. So also we can easily incorporate some, several type of cross factor and the uh, drug or the DNA into the 3D scaffold. So it can improve the tissue regeneration. So most important thing, like we can use patient stem cell into the scaffold and combine with microfabrication technique, we can create it, uh, the functional tissue construct. It can be used uh, instead of using autograft or also the allograft. So we can solve the each of the donor shortage. Also, we can prevent the immune rejection when you implant these construct. So there are many advantages of this technique. Then, however, there are, uh, the problem is highly developed, uh, organized, uh, and functionalized 3D tissue are uh, difficult to uh, mimic uh, with conventional uh, microfabrication technique because the living tissue are complex and composed of multi-cell uh, uh, cell type. It also consists of the um, the smaller repeating unit, which is few hundred micro size, along with vessel. So the conventional biomaterial and bio uh, microfabrication technique is difficult to uh, mimic those uh, tailored uh, biological and mechanical property which mimic the native tissue construct. So, so in our lab, how to address this challenge? First, we want to develop a uh, biomaterial to mimic native extracellular matrix. So mainly our lab is using naturally derived polymer. And but however, this polymer are difficult to mimic physio physiological and biological function of native tissue. So always we should bring the nanoparticle and gross factor, other biological reagent to improve the function of the biomaterial. Once we when we engineer the biomaterial, we can combine it can be combined with uh, microfabrication technique so later we can finally fabricate 3d complex architecture then so until now i have been developing various type of uh, hydro job so combined with cross factor and conductive nanoparticle and also other you know metallic nanoparticle then we uh, successfully create 3d vascularized tissue construct and bone tissue also the functional cardiac tissue. Then the later also we bring the unique type of nanoparticle, which is zinc oxide, we can bring antibacterial activity also as well. So then, then I want to introduce one of example how to engineer a hydrogel with electrical conduct nanoparticle to create functional cardiac tissue. So cardiac tissue is the dense quasi lamellar structure, which also integrate with a dense vessel network. So in this, her tissue has very special component, which is electrical conduction system, which can deliver biological signal to the uh, muscle. So biological signal is like action potential, but it is not a neuron cell, but this type of the very specific cell, but can deliver biological you know, signal to the muscle. So we are introduced to uh, mimic those Purkinje fibers, especially for their function. So however, the conventional hydrogel is difficult to mimic this function um, and because of it has a weak mechanical property, also has a lack of the electrical conductivity. To bring those uh, property, so we are interested to use uh, electrical conductive uh, carbon-based material, such as carbon tube and graphene and then graphene oxide. Then, but the major issue of the you know the using this nanoparticle is how to disperse nanoparticle in pre-polymer solution without using toxic surfactant or organic solvent. So when you use surfactant and organic solvent, it kills the cell at all. So then we study several type of uh, biomaterial, which is a linear polymeric chain. It also have a strong interaction with nanoparticle. At the same time, you also can interact with water. So gelatin and DNA or hyaluronic acid has almost like a, the jitter ionic function. It also has hydrophobic and then uh, property. Then, you know, then we can easily disperse and this nanoparticle into the uh, and uh, nanoparticle with a common tube or graphene. So this flexible polymer chain and can coat it on the surface of common tube and graphene, and we successfully disperse this nanoparticle up to uh, seven milligrams per ml. 
Then, as we want to show how this nanoparticle improved the mechanical property of natural polymer. Then, in this time, we use the uh, the very elastic uh, material, which is the elastin existing in body, which is insoluble natural protein, and it has very unique structure and the unique resilient property. Then, when we combine with this, when this polymer combined with uh, graphene oxide, we create this you know hybrid hydrogel still maintain the porous structure. Then and also these graphics were just coated by the um, elastin uh, material. Then we characterize the mechanical property. It generate, uh, it improved the uh, uh, stiffness of electric modulus and also increased the toughness a lot. Normally, as you know, hydrogel, we couldn't turn and we couldn't twist because it naturally very weak uh, material, but an uh, elastin is a highly you know, elastic material, you can easily turn, but after combined with, with graphene oxide, and then we can increase the toughness, you can turn the hydrogel with 27 times compared with pristine hydrogel, which is 18 times. Because of nanoparticle in strongly interact with this polymer chain, that against the torsion behavior, torsion, so we can easily improve the, this mechanical property by adding up the graphene oxide. After that, we want to know whether many people are concerned about the biocompatibility of the, this hybrid hydrogel. So we, put, we simply tested biocompatibility using the animal model. So we first fabricate hydrogel, we implant into the animal and subcutaneous. We characterize their uh, immune response, but there are uh, less expression of the CD3, which is for T lymphocyte, and also CD68 for the macrophage. So we finally observed this hybrid hydrogel showed a good uh, kind of laboratory good biocompatibility. So after checking this, you know, behave, we want to know how this nanoparticle change the phenotype of the cell and it regulate the behavior. We also want to know what type of uh, uh, carbon tube, what uh, what type of uh, carbon material is good to show the best function. So we uh, fabricate three different type of hybrid hydrogel with including carbon tube and graphene oxide with this graphene oxide. Those three nanoparticles almost had similar chemistry, chemical structure, but it has different shape when you compare with carbon tube and reduced graphene oxide, but it also have a, uh, we can make a different conductivity, but still maintain the same shape. So when we uh, characterize this during, uh, different hydrogel, we observe the carbon tube have more nanofibrous network and compare with graphene oxide and reduced graphene oxide. Then uh, we characterize electrical conductivity. Uh, so carbon tube reduced graphene oxide has higher electrical conductivity compared with graphene oxide laden hydrogel and pristine gel. It, uh, they are almost uh, insulator. Then we uh, characterize mechanical property, which is the very important parameter to uh, in, uh, improve the maturation or decrease maturation of the cardiac tissue. Then, but we also only want to see the nanoparticle effect. So we. Uh, uh, make the same mechanical property of the overall hybrid hydrogel, like a uh, six kilopascal. Then we characterize the mechanical property of the particle by AFM method. Then we, as you can see this figure, then we observe the graphene oxide and reduce graphene oxide and improve the elastic modulus and more than 50 kilopascal compared with carbon tube. And it is from you know, maybe a little aggregation of graphene oxide and during the day dispersion. So it improved the uh, increased elastic modulus compared with the monodispersed carbon tube. Then we seeded cardiomycite on these three substrate. Then as you can see here, so, and we observed the, uh, the spindle shape of the uh, cell uh, cardiomycite behavior on the CNT uh, gelma and the rectangular shape of the reduced graphene oxide. Then as you can see, uh, three different substrate, we observe the cell, cardiac cell, well matured and dispersed, well matured and organized on two uh, electrical conductive substrate compared with without, uh, there's no uh, electrical conductive uh, property on graphene oxide gelma. Then, and then we, we confirm this electrical conductive suffering can improve the maturation of the cardiac tissue. Then we want to more study the how these physiological properties change on these substrate. Then we uh, uh, analyze the uh, action potential by patch cleft method and 
structured cardiomyocyte on three different substrate. So as you can see, the cardiomyocyte show the uh, like a ventricular like uh, action potential compared with graphene oxide and reduced graphene oxide. In some, it, this is might be effect on the physical property of the substrate. For example, carbonyl tube have a smaller pore size compared with graphene oxide and reduced graphene oxide. And it also has better conductivity. Then in this time, this uh, substrate can induce ventricular like uh, action potential. In case of the reduced graphene oxide, they have a larger pore size, but still had conductive. Then in this case, they are uh, show intermediate stage, atrium and ventricular like uh, action potential. It is very pretty interest. The, based on the what the physical property of the hybrid substrate, it can tune the action potential of the cardiomyocyte. Then we confirm what the major factor uh, uh, regulate the cardiomyocyte and change their phenotype. So we uh, did some several um, as uh, we uh, underlined several of of the protein which relevant with mechanical sensing signal. Then we observe the pinkolin and saccharomyces affecting more expressed on the conductive two conductive substrate, and also electrical and metabolic coupling associate protein, and also can express on the carbonyl tube and reduced graphene oxide. So it looks like uh, we conclude carbonyl tube graphene reduced graphene oxide like a uh, the good material to maturation of the cardiomyocyte. But we want to know what of the which material is the best. And then we did and uh, we analyzed integrated mediated mechanical transduction signaling, and especially for yaptat or vinculin, and we observed the high expression on the, sorry, high expression on the carbonatium substrate compared to the reduced graphene oxide. Then when we, you know, finally we conclude three different type of nanoparticle based on the, what their physical property and electrical property, so we can tune the phenotype of the cardiomyocyte. So the conclusion of this you know, study, so when we have a, when nanoparticle has better electrical conductivity, we can expect it better uh, uh, the, uh, maturation along with the smooth surface. Also the mechanical property, if too high is not good, too low also not good for the cardiomyocyte maturation. We have to maintain the mechanical property between 20 kilopascal to the 40 kilopascal, we expect a better cardiomyocyte maturation. Or the pore size or the nano wire network is way better compared with larger pore size and which can improve, uh, stimulate to the mechano specific mechanical sensing signal and we improve the maturation. So after we optimize and then we know the how to design of the hybrid scaffold and then we want to uh, make some of interesting, uh, you know, soft robot um, using this material. So the one of the ocean organism, which is the manta, is the, uh, like a flat fish, which is the cartridge, mainly cartridge and the muscle. Then we can easily mimic using the two different type of hydrogel. So as you can see, carbonyl tube is good for the cardiac tissue maturation. So we can using this material for the muscle part. We also picked the one of the biocompatible non-degradable hydrogel, which also generates stiff uh, mechanical property which is the pad, it can use it for the cartridge parts. So using photo uh, we can fabricate micro pattern the hydrogel with one centimeter gel fish. Then it also can integrate with micro fabricated electrode, which is the biocompatible. So we can easily incorporate into hydrogel. Then we see the cardiomyocyte after a few days culture, we observe the will align the cardiom uh, muscle, sorry, and and the muscle alignment. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. Then and then we can see the uh, very good uh, sacromoric, you know, alpha clean alignment. Then later we expected better, you know, more complicated actuation behavior. And so when, you know, wing contract and tail is extended based on the alignment of the micro pattern, then when we change the uh, micro pattern and their direction, we also can tune the direction of the uh, actuation behavior. So until now, I most uh, explained to you how to engineer nanoparticle laden hydrogel and how we use this material for uh, improve the maturation of chitomyces and then introduce one of the example of the application as soft robot. Then now I wanna talking about 
how to you know create 3D tissue construct combined with those advanced material. Then I've been using many different type of microfabrication technique, including the bioprinting. So now I'm mainly using the bioprinting technique. But I'm in this case, I'm not developing new bioprinter, but I'm more focused on developing the bio ink, which is good for the uh, making t functional tissue construct. So I'm mainly using four different type of bio ink. One of them, reversible and li rapid ionic crossing carbon isonate. The other one is like a short dating material, which have a strong physical interaction between the polymer it can be used for the also bio ink. Also, I'm mainly using thermal sensitive gelatin based ink. It also can be uh, attuned by chemical modification. It also can crossing by light. So we can using those two different type of ink to create a functional tissue, uh, to create a 3D uh, tissue construct. So another important thing for the bio ink, which is the shear stress. How to decrease shear stress to maintain the high cell viability during the printing process. It is very important later so we have to maintain high uh, viability and then we can expect it functional tissue construct. After optimization of the bio ink and their printing parameter, we able able to create thick uh, tall construct also with various, you know, biomimetic shape. Then, so once when we develop those bioprinting technique, we uh, decide to develop, you know, a best graph construct because which is a major component to tissue survive for a long time within the construct. So th through the vessel, we can uh, apply, supply the oxygen and nutrient. Then we encapsulate endothelial cell, and then we uh, print and uh, lay with a bioprinting technique. So we finally observe the lumen shape, like a lumen shape, but um, we are not sure whether this center will be empty or not. So and then we uh, modify the uh, uh, printing method a little bit using the core shell structure. So we successfully, fabric, we successfully create a hollow tube uh, it also can stack to the 10 layer. So then when after culture for one week, then we also propulsed PBS uh, through the, this hollow channel. So and then we, uh, uh, so also this cell will grow, especially for the mesocom stem cell, will grow in this, you know, printed wall. Then later it can be, can be implanted into the, the animal can check the, their function. Then after uh, creating the best cell construct, then we want to uh, you know, improve the mechanical property of the bio ink because the conventional bio ink has weak mechanical property. So difficult to create large tissue construct, so it's difficult to handle. During the you know, implantation of construct, it will be break uh, by physical stress. So we want to improve the mechanical property of the bio ink. In this time, we, use the, we add a silk ferrin, which is mechanically robust. And also, it has also exceptionally resilient so the another advantage of the silk is biodegradable. So compare compare with the robust uh, synthetic material. So and then we add this silk fibrin into the, our ink, and later we fabricate large scale, each to handle three D printed construct. Then we characterize the printed construct. We can easily load it on the e strong machine. Can stretch, and um, then we finally observe their good mechanical property and compare with without uh, vibrin. Then also we can apply the cyclic stretching up to the 10 uh, strain late. So it can it return to their original position. So because of the vibrin has better sheet structure, so it leading to an enhanced elastic nature of the print, 3D printed microfibers, fibrous construct. So, and then this silk is efficiently improve the mechanical property of the overall bio ink. It can be used for the any other type of muscle regeneration. So to confirm this material is good for the muscle, for example, the cardiac tissue construct. So we seeded IPS derived, the human IPS derived cardiomyocyte on the printed construct. So after a few days culture, we observed the well matured, well aligned cardiomyocyte on top of this scaffold. Uh, after seven days culture, we observed a strong uh, spontaneous feeding behavior. So in the beginning, we developed the bioprinting technique in bio ink to fabricate vessel component and combined with two printing technique, we created the 3D base scratch cardiac tissue construct. So then, so this is what the uh, many single material printing technique and more focused on the how to uh, develop the bio ink. But now I move to uh, the next phase, how to improve the printing ability and create more uh, the complicated 3D construct. So now I'm using 
you know, micro fleet based node system. So now in the, in the beginning, I used two channel, but now I'm using six channel. Then we can easily add six different bio ink with six different type, different type of cell. But I'm just, you know, only the uh, micro fleet node is not enough to create more complicated control because the conventional, you know, printing method is layer by layer sticking method. So it's difficult to create, uh, you know, a freestanding hydrogen construct. So we are using to solve this issue. We are using self-healing supporting hydrogel. So we, you can easily deposit many different material in, you know, in all direction. Then this is one of the example. So how to use this uh, bioprinting technique to create uh, biomimetic tissue. So first we decide to uh, create a cartridge tissue which has limited regeneration capacity compared with other tissue or organ. But on the native tissue, native cardiac cartridge tissue has very unique mechanical property. So the metrics have highly tough uh, extracellular metrics, but uh, the single control site are embedded in tough extracellular metrics, but this control site coated by the soft, you know, pericellular metrics. So if this is difficult to, you know, mimic this construct with conventional method, it requires for a long time to uh, mimic those construct with conventional uh, fabrication method. Then we modify our printing technique and we first develop, you know, uh, self-healing supporting best after cross-linking, it can be the tough hydrogel and then we using fibrin-based uh, bio-ink and which encapsulate with mescama stem cell can be the control site also, uh, it can the fibrin gel can be the pericellular matrix. Then, after optimization or parameter, so we characterize tough uh, hard hydrogel with the mega Pascal scale. It also we can apply the cycling load with twenty uh, percent strain. It the uh, hydrogel without any breaking the, against the, this uh, mechanical load, and also the soft hydrogel has around two kilopascal and or it helps to uh, deliver oxygen and nutrient. At the same time, you also help to remove the uh, waste product during the, uh, the uh, during the differentiation of mesenchymal stem cell. Then and then, so we uh, uh, finally cultured this construct for more than uh, four weeks, and we finally observed the uh, well, uh, we uh, chondrogenic differentiation in this printed construct, which confirmed by several type of uh, biomarker with immunohistochemistry. So we confirm this material method is good for to build cartridge-like tissue construct. So another interesting research is we want to bring the function of the tissue. So not only the mimic the structure or shape of the uh, tissue, in this time, and then we already developed you know, how to build the cartridge tissue, right? Then, and then we are, uh, you know, bring the some of function of the tissue, which is your nose. The so nose can detect any smell, means like a, a other a molecule. Then we've tuned our printing method and the bio ink. We first fabricate node construct. It can be combined with biosensor, which can detect other molecule. Then, so we, you know, as I told you, we first optimize soft and speed, uh, steep bio ink. We finally created a cartridge like tissue construct and it compound by some of specific, you know, um, specific, you know, uh, the chondrogenic marker. Chondrogenic macro, which is collagen H type 2, we confirm and the whole node construct generate with strong expression of collagen H type 2. And later, it uh, we say like uh, we using these two ink, we successfully create a cart cartridge tissue construct with no shape. Then the, another important factor is like a biosensor have to be biocompatible, then easily integrate into the uh, no live node tissue. So we characterize biocompatibility of the biosensor. We see it, uh, we see this, we culture the cell on this electrode. We observe the good biocompatibility in uh, up to seven days. Then and then we optimize, we uh, find the method, how to detect the biomarker with biocompatible method. So we did, we decided uh, electrochemical impedance uh, detection method, which is the label free detection. Sometimes label like a specific strong, uh, strong a redox uh, re uh, reagent it, it is toxic to the cell. Then we using this you know electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, we able to detect low concentration of antigen with biocompatible manner. Then another problem is like electrolyte. So the conventional electrolyte which is uh, toxic, it decreased the viability. So we have to find a way how to monitor the order factor 
in this, uh, the biocompatible uh, electrolyte. So we study of the circulatory media, which is including some certain amount of salt in the protein, which can improve the, uh, the capacitance on when it immobilized on the surface of the antigen, so like here. And then we found the relationship when we increase concentration of other factor at the same time increase capacitance. So we believe we can monitor one of the other factor and within the circulatory media. So we to confirm our to prove up to confirm our hypothesis, we pick one of the other reagent, which is like a prevalent explosive, can be used in various industrial industrial area. Then we found the specific peptide chain to be able to capture this TMP, the immobilizer of the electrode, and uh, we, after we culture, we printed on the no cell-laden nodes construct after a few days culture, so we able to detect the TMP within the, uh, the secretion media. Of course, the, when we use ferrocyanide, we can see the higher sensitivity, but we also, you know, but in secretion media, we also able to detect carbon, uh, TNT molecule with uh, uh, live tissue color. So this is what uh, our, you know, my, you know, last presentation. So using, you know, advanced bioprinting technique combined with bio ink. So in my lab, we successfully fabricate 3D vessel network, vascular heart tissue, also scatter muscle. Now we also, we have a list of publication which can create 3D, you know, brain tissues as well. So, and, you know, using this technique, we able to uh, fabricate biomimetic, uh, tissue construct uh, which mimic in uh, body component. So so this is my presentation slide. Thank you so much for listening for my talk. So if you have any question, then please let me know. I'm happy to answer for all those questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Su Ryong. Yes. Very, very nice, very excited uh, seminary. Thank you very much. Thank you for yeah, taking your you time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. We yes. have we have time for one or two questions or comments, please. We can do these comments in English or in Portuguese. And after we can translate, no problem. If you have a question, please, we can talk. But if you... Uh, many people talk, congrats for the, the excellent <laughs> title and, uh, and uh, lecture. I, 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 I have just one question. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the polymer mm -hmm. and the, the rheology, yeah. uh, uh, are you uh, working with uh, polyethylene glycol and another polymers? Yeah, I, 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 I have been tested many different Can you talk about it? Yeah, yeah. Can you talk about this control to control the rheology properties? Because I guess for main application in 3D printing, yeah. printer, for example, you need to control this rheology. This is a big yeah, problem. Yeah, very good and important question. So when we build you know, bio ink, one of the major uh, parameter is the rheological property of the pre-polymer solution before cross-linking. So if too uh, low viscous, if polymer has too low viscous, you unable to printing with conventional bioprinting technique. But if too stiff, and it also generate a uh, high short stress on the cell, and also decrease the uh, viability of the cell during the printing. So we need to play with this, you know, um, neurological property of the pre-polymer solution. So we prepare using like a little high viscous, but, um, but the most important thing, like uh, we have to make a fast chemical or physical cross-linking when the ink is through the uh, nozzle, that then we're able to stack those hydrogel. So this is very important. So I, I use the PEG, PEG, polyethylene glycol, but it has the low, lower viscosity. Of course, it depends on the molecular weight and the molecular weight, but um, you know, mostly this PEG is uh, good for the reagent to make a stiff hydrogel. But uh, when you use gelatin or alginate, it has the favorable viscosity. So normally when I add gelatin or uh, alginate uh, to control the viscosity. But if you want to have a more uh, soft tissue, you don't need to, you won't able to, uh, we don't add any pack. But if you want to make a more stiff tissue, then in case of we add some of synthetic, like a pack or other synthetic polymer, but you have to dissolve it in the water-based solvent, not the organic solvent, because we want to add the cell in the bio ink 
and we won't still survive in this ink. So most of polymer have to dissolve the, uh, the water and maintain uh, some, um, somehow appropriate level of you know, viscosity. But of course, this viscosity, it depends on the type of the bioprinting yeah. technique. Yes. Yeah. I see. We have this comment, which type of bio ink do you work with for 3D electrochemical sensor? Thank you, Mariana, for the question. Yeah, so I, I didn't add the presented slide in here. So, so since, uh, you know, until now I have been developed by your compatible con conductive ink. So especially for the uh, carbonyl tube and gold nanoparticle I have been used. So when you increase concentration of a carbonyl tube, but it dispersed by the biomaterial, not the sur toxic surfactant and uh, organic solvent, you weren't able to use it for the tissue. So in this case, I use like a um, hyaluronic acid in DNA and then can disperse, can efficiently disperse carbon tube with high concentration. So we able to create any, you know, electronic device on the uh, flexible substrate with good mechanical electrical property. It was published in advanced material in 2000, I think 18 or 16. So and you can find the formulation of, you know, the what biomaterial you use to make electrical conductive ink. Yes. Thank you. The last question in this in the YouTube channel, because mm -hmm. after now your conference, we invite the, all, all people to stay on the Google Meet room. Mm -hmm. uh, the link was uh, sent by mail to discuss mm -hmm. with more yeah. time with Dr. Sur Rion. This is the last uh, question in using the YouTube platform, please. <laughs> please if you can comment about the regulatory issues for the bio ink composition, how mm -hmm. How yeah. you are seeing this approval for using as a possible commercial solution? Um, mainly, you know, uh, I just already mentioned for you, but I'm, you know, how to, you know, the bio ink, I told you most important, it depends on the, what the printing technique first. So for example, many people using, uh, you know, conventional laser based technique because it's very pretty easy to using the different various type of bio ink. It really depends on the viscosity is major important. Also, the, I told you the shear stress, how to decrease the shear stress in the nozzle. So, and then we, we can maintain the, uh, the viability of the printing. Also, the, you know, um, cross-inking, we have to uh, have, the bio ink has to have fast ionic or chemical cross-inking. For the commercial one, then, of course, many people, we have to using, you know, if you want to make a commercial product. So, most of the commercial product, like using the uh, FDA approved material, but I'm their chemical, very similar with uh, other, you know, researcher using some chemical modification to able to make cross thinking by light or visual light or something. Then, but mainly we prefer to use in the FDA material. The later when you build the bio ink, it later have chance to be more commercial product. So now in our lab using medical grade JAMA. So we, since now we use uh, the JAMA synthesized in our lab, but I'm working with a collaborator in one of the company in the uh, Europe, they are produced the uh, co uh, commercial or uh, medical grade JAMA. Then and then later we can expect it better by being to be able to use in you know uh, the medical area and making the commercial product. Yes. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Su. Thank you for taking your time with us. Uh, okay. After now this conference, you can talk with Dr. Su in the uh, the the Google Meet. Yeah. Room, please. Yeah, thank you so much. I will join your skill Google Meet. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Bye bye.
Hello, Dr. Eliani Soto. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Very nice. Thank you. Please stay to take your time with us. <laughs> Saudações a Portugal. Uh, again, please. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Eliana Bissot is the, the, the second lecture of this, this in our conference. The title of the, the letter is Formulating Topical SLN NLC Drug Delivery System with Natural Polymers. Eliana Bissot is an assistant professor with habilitation from the Department, Department of Pharmaceutical Technology at, at the Faculty of Pharmacy of the University of Coimbra. He, his research group is devoted to the design, development, and characterization of new drug, drug delivery system to overcome biological barriers with a special interest in BRB and BBB. Thank you very much to stay with us. If you want to, to include your presentation, your slides, thank yes. you for say, to take your time in our conference. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. I will share the screen, I will try to do it now, and then you will tell me if I succeeded. So is this fine? Can you see the presentation? It's okay, it's okay for us. Okay. But you, you you need to open your camera because I, because I I can see you I can see you please. Um, I will try to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one second. But the presentation is okay. You can see the your. Okay. What about no now? What about now? No, but let's go. We can we can see just your presentation. You cannot see your camera. I don't know why. Let's go. So it is fine now. Very nice. Let's talk. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank the organization uh, and the scientific committee for the. Um, so this is not working. Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, for the uh, uh, invitation um, to participate in this time in the event. Uh, this is really a great honor to me uh, to interact even remotely with my fellow colleagues from Brazil, uh, with whom I have uh, been collaborating actively and intensively uh, over the last decade. So my main topic of research is uh, um, related to the uh, biomedical applications of nanoparticles, as you said. Uh, in general, uh, nanoparticles in general, uh, and uh, those based on lipid materials in particular. So my interest on uh, natural polymers, uh, to make the link uh, to the topic of this conference, uh, is due to the um, need of suitable vehicles for the formulation of my particles into topical, uh, um, uh, for the, into topical products. So in the upcoming uh, 25 minutes, I will be talking about the various aspects uh, of the rheological uh, behavior of lipid nanoparticle dispersions as viscosity enhancers uh, to, um, um, of gels uh, obtained from natural polymers. A brief introduction uh, to these carriers. So since the 80s, uh, the nanoparticles uh, have been captured the attention and the imagination of scientists and engineers because of their technological potential uh, and for their uh, scientific uh, challenges. So among the particles that we know nowadays, lipid nanoparticles um, in the solid state, so these means particles uh, with a matrix or a core uh, that melts above the body temperature brings several advantages uh, linked to the possibility to modify the release profile of the loaded drug while keeping uh, their safety and biocompatible uh, profiles. There is an endless number of uh, papers describing the lipid nanoparticles and drawing uh, their theoretical models. Uh, I took this image from uh, an open access journal just to illustrate um, uh, the, um, uh, what lipid nanoparticle dispersions look like. So we have a, a, a lipid uh, core 
which is uh, uh, suspended in, in an aqueous uh, environment. Uh, and the lipid core is stabilized by a suitable surfactant. Sometimes we use a cost surfactant to increase uh, the uh, long-term stability of the system. So in um, the, the, the basic, uh, I mean, the background uh, of the development of lipid nanoparticles was, in fact, nanoemulsions. So in nanoemulsions, we have an oil dispersed in an aqueous system. In a lipid nanoparticle uh, suspension, we have a lipid core uh, dispersed in an aqueous system. Um, and uh, the, the, the literature describes three main models or three main types of lipid uh, nanoparticles. Uh, one is the so-called solid lipid nanoparticles. Uh, <clears throat> the, lipid, the solid lipid nanoparticles, uh, they are produced from solid lipids only, uh, which recrystallize in a highly organized structure. Uh, <clears throat> creating perfect crystals. So this um, uh, illustration here resembles a perfect crystal uh, of lipid uh, materials. Uh, so they uh, are based on a brick wall structure, which means that they have uh, lipid molecules very well organized, creating less spaces, so less vacancies to accommodate the drug molecules. So the drug is usually uh, molecularly dispersed in this uh, brick wall uh, structure. And the result will be a lower um, drug loading capacity, a uh, higher risk of drug expulsion uh, over a storage time, uh, lower flexibility in modifying the release profile of the, of the drug, and the, there is no possibility to trigger the release of the drug from uh, the system. Uh, so for the production of these carriers, we usually use only solid lipids. Examples of three glycerides are very common. For the uh, nano shorter lipid carriers, so the second type uh, of the systems that are uh, described in the scientific li literature, these are obtained from a blend of solid lipids with liquid lipids, uh, but the particles, they remain solid at body temperature. Uh, but they recrystallize in a less organized uh, structure. So SLN are based in this more unorganized uh, matrix, creating a higher number of voids and vacancies that are able to accommodate uh, the drug molecules. So when comparing to the NLC, so the previous one, the, uh, sorry, uh, when comparing to the SLN, uh, the NLC will have a higher capacity to load the drug um, no risk of an explosion over storage time or reduce the risk, a higher flexibility to modulate the drug release and the possibility to achieve the triggered drug release. We have recently published a review uh, reporting the most commonly used lipids and surfactants in SLN and NLC production and of relevance uh, to highlight uh, are the mixtures uh, of the mono D and triglycerides, uh, basically presirol, softizan, and compitol, and also triglycerides, the typical uh, dinazan. Uh, for these surfactants, the uh, typical are the classical poloxamas and twin 80. They dominate by far the selection of surfactants in the production of SLN and NLC, uh, in particular for intravenous and for ocular administration. But when it comes to uh, the topical application onto the skin, uh, we see a higher range of surfactants that are able to be used, uh, including tuloxacol, that we, uh, we will uh, talk about later. So we are dealing with uh, uh, solid lipid particles. Um, so this means that um, it is relevant to ensure that the matrix is solid or is uh, recrystallized um, when we compare both SLN and NLC by wide angle x-ray diffraction. And we see um, in SLN, uh, as mentioned before, they are based only on solid lipids, and uh, which means that in the x-ray pattern we will see the typical um, scattering peaks of triglycerides. So they are here perfectly visible in this red line, indicating that lipid matrix is uh, in a crystalline uh, um, or has a crystalline character. Uh, we see that upon crystallization of the particles, um, sorry, upon the crystallization of the particles, the first peak appearing uh, is the alpha form. In the NLC, uh, this is a mixture, so the NLC are based on a mixture of solid and liquid lipids. We don't see the typical 
three new isomers, but we will find uh, the um, uh, 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 deviation, a uh, higher deviation from the baseline. So this uh, line here uh, in uh, green, uh, which indicates the presence of a more amorphous state. So the crystalline character is a prerequisite for the use of lipid particles as drug carriers. But the problem with the uh, uh, SLN and NLC dispersions are, uh, is that they are too liquid. So this means that we, uh, they, we have a very low viscosity. Uh, so the, 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 the dispersions, they have a very low viscosity to be used uh, as topical formulations per se. Uh, and our fundamental understanding of the flow behavior of the aqueous SLN and NLC dispersions is rather limited these days. Uh, and this is the fact due to the fact that the rheology, the rheology of these systems is much more complicated than the ordinary uh, isotropic polymeric fluids. So systematic and reliable data are lacking uh, uh, so far, uh, uh, but this is the kind of information that we need for the development and for the assessment uh, of drug delivery systems intended for topical uh, administration. And uh, if we uh, have a closer look uh, at the results from the oscillation frequency strip test applying a frequency range from uh, 0.1 to 10 Hz at a constant uh, frequency at a stress amplitude of 5 Pascal. For both SLN and NLC uh, dispersions, regardless the magnitude, we will find that the storage modulus uh, uh, is higher than the uh, loss modulus for both um, uh, types of systems. So this means that both systems they are more elastic than viscous in the investigated frequency range. Uh, so we can also assume that there is a viscoelasticity uh, in both systems because of the storage models, uh, because the storage models is higher than the loss models. Um, the, um, the, 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 storage, the storage models of the G-prime uh, show um, and also the, 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 the loss model, they both show a weak, a weak dependence on the implied frequency um, while the viscosity increases, uh, sorry, decreases with increasing uh, of the frequency, uh, which also shows uh, that we are in the presence of pseudoplastic, uh, of pseudoplastic systems. So, but again, the problem that we encounter with the use of lipid nanoparticles is that uh, they are still very liquid for topical application. So, um, and why? Because uh, the particles, uh, they are produced with a, uh, around, uh, with amount of 10% uh, uh, of liquid, and the rest is water. So 90% uh, is water. But we can uh, develop um, a semi-solid formulation to trigger the drug uh, from the nanoparticles, uh, and simultaneously uh, providing enhanced uh, viscosity uh, of the formulation. And this can be done by creating uh, super saturated uh, systems using natural polymers to produce hydrogels. Uh, so how can we do this? Um, so this is very simple. The first, we load the, na the nanoparticles with the drug uh, before uh, dispersing nanoparticles in the gel. And secondly, we will also be loading the hydrogel with the respective drug. So we will have drug inside the particles and also drug outside the particles. So this, mean, this means in the hydrogel. The, th the third step will be the dispersing the SLN or NLC dispersion, uh, I mean, uh, yes, suspension, uh, into the developed uh, hydrogel. So upon uh, the topical application uh, of the developed formulation, because of the increased skin temperature and water evapor evapor evaporation from the gel, uh, polymorphic transformations will occur from the most unstable to the most stable uh, um, uh, polymorphic uh, form of lipids, uh, of lipid crystal. They will occur in lipid matrix. Uh, and the, the result is that this mechanism will expel the drug from the carrier to the semi-solid gel, uh, which is already saturated uh, with the drug, uh, creating a super saturation, a su super saturated system, and because of this higher thermodynamic activity, a higher degree of drug penetration uh, will happen and will uh, 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 penetrate uh, in, within the skin. So a higher thermodynamic activity will uh, result in a higher penetration of the drug onto the skin. So, um, according to this uh, uh, um, super saturation system, so this, this idea of dispersing 
um, drug loaded nanoparticles into uh, drug uh, loaded hydrogels. Um, here is uh, um, the proposed three dimensional uh, model network for the SLN and NLC interact into uh, hydrogels. So these hydrogels, they can be made with uh, natural polymers and also with synthetic polymers and uh, uh, synthetic ones. So the hydrogels, they are defined uh, with many cross-links uh, organized in, a, in this three-dimensional network. So this network created by the uh, immobilization of water molecules is responsible for the resistance of the gel to the deformation. However, once uh, incorporating the lipid nanoparticles into this uh, uh, network, a completely different rheological behavior will be uh, obtained. Uh, so this is a theoretically proposed uh, that nanoparticles, they can indeed be interact in, and physically stabilized in this uh, gel network. And this model has been developed, experimentally developed, using three distinct uh, natural polymers, uh, so two natural polymers and a non -synthetic, synthetic one. So we have used, used chitosan, xanthan gum, and uh, cellulose derivative, uh, the hydroxyethyl cellulose for the uh, production uh, of uh, SLN and NLC based um, hydrogel formulations. So for the production of chitosan and uh, uh, xanthan gum uh, hydrogels, 1% of polymer has been uh, used, uh, while for the uh, hydroxyethyl cellulose hydrogels, we use 1.75% uh, of concentration of polymer. So the final composition of the uh, developed uh, formulations is the bit here. Uh, semi solid uh, systems containing 10% um, of lipid phase uh, have been uh, prepared, and those formulations they have been then stored uh, in optimized packaging material. Uh, and further characterized. So, um, with respect to the physical chemical uh, analysis, so the first observation here uh, is that, it, that that you can highlight uh, is the high uh, zeta potential values recorded for all uh, developed uh, formulations. Uh, as expected, chitosan uh, resulted in positively charged particles, while the chitosan, while the uh, xanthan gum and uh, hydroxyethyl cellulose uh, based formulations. Uh, resulted in negatively charged particles. Besides that, uh, after the dispersion uh, of the uh, particles uh, in the natural polymeric hydrogels, um, the particles they remain separated. Uh, this means, uh, sorry, this means no. Um, this means no uh, uh, no aggregation uh, happen because we don't see here a uh, big peak. Uh, in the uh, uh, mean particle size, nor a higher uh, polydispersity uh, index. So the mean particle size remained around 300. The highest size was shown here in the NLC-based accent and gum formulations. Uh, and the uh, polydispersity index below uh, 0.4. Um, from the DSC analysis, it is visible the uh, solid character, so the dispersion of nanoparticles in these uh, hydrogels, they remained uh, solid um, as the, 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 mean, the, the melting point uh, was about uh, 40 degrees, uh, the onset temperature was also about 40 degrees, uh, which is a prerequisite for the uh, use of SLN and NLC as uh, drug delivery systems. And as mentioned before, so conventional SLN analysis uh, dispersions, they contain about 10 uh, to 20% of lipid matrix, and the rest is water. So we need uh, to use uh, uh, semi solid uh, hydrogels or creams uh, to uh, have um, a huge value, so to have um, um, viscosity um, and to, to, to develop a topical uh, formulation. Um, to be spread on the screen. So we, uh, we can use hydrogels or we can use creams to obtain this topical application form by having the design in solid consistency. But incompatibilities uh, with ingredients from the hydrogel or from the cream uh, may occur during the interactions uh, because of the interactions between the gel forming polymer, between the emulsifying agents or the surfactants used uh, for the stabilization of the particles um, with the lipid or even with the drug. So these interactions, they can affect the semi-solid semi consistency, 
uh, of the uh, topical formulation. Uh, so the rheological status, uh, which is a very important physical chemical parameter in the development uh, of a potential drug delivery system, uh, is um, uh, needed. Um, so is is, man is mandatory for um, this study. So the neurological behavior of these uh, four high, uh, these uh, three uh, hydrogel that SLN and LC have been uh, has been studied, and the obtained curves uh, are shown uh, here. So the incorporation of lipid particles into xanthan gum hydrogels resulted in flow curves with the plastic uh, properties, uh, uh, where the uh, shear rate increases with increasing of the shear stress. So ascending and descending curves they overlap, so we don't see them here. Um, which means that no time effects like tixotropy existed. So the lipid particles in the semi-solid system, they uh, have the tendency to align uh, with increasing shear rate, uh, which is alleviating the flow. So this phenomenon was more emphasized for the NLC containing hydrogels uh, than for, for the uh, SLN containing hydrogels, regarding less dependency upon the applied shear stress. For the um, uh, uh, hydroxyethyl cellulose uh, hydrogels, uh, they also show flow cores with their plastic properties, uh, although the magnitude of the shear rate is much lower in comparison uh, to the uh, xanthan gum based uh, hydrogels. With respect to the chitosan hydrogels, they reveal a more Newtonian behavior uh, with a yield value of approximately uh, zero. So to, to sum up, uh, the, the, the liquid content and also the type of the system, depending uh, whether we have NLC or uh, uh, SLM, uh, we will have the different uh, flow uh, properties. The flow cores of the pure gels, of the pure hydrogels, they reveal a weaker and more sensitive uh, structure, so they are not seen here. Um, but um, this information is in comparison to the uh, SLN and NLC containing hydrogels. Uh, all in all, uh, NLC containing hydrogels uh, were shown to have a higher dependency to the shear uh, stress rather than the uh, SLN uh, uh, containing hydrogels. <clears throat> so, uh, tixotropy could be uh, observed with the systems having higher lipid content, uh, but the, uh, uh, for the um, cellulose derivative hydrogel and chitosan hydrogel, uh, they were more liquid. Uh, the shear rate uh, was much uh, lower in terms of magnitude than the, the xanthan gum. So we have selected the xanthan gum based hydrogels for the uh, next, um, for the further studies. And the next uh, characterization has been uh, the uh, uh, texture analysis. So we have used three empirical tests, uh, the adhesiveness, consistency and the gel strength. So the adhesiveness uh, uh, which is the force necessary to overcome the attractive, attractive forces uh, between the sample and the probe. Uh, it was shown to be similar in both types of um, uh, lipid nanoparticle semi-solid formulations. Regarding the consistency test, uh, which is related to the force needed to lift the sample probe to a preset distance, they revealed to be higher in SLN rather than in uh, NLC. And finally, the gel strength was also, um, so that is defined as a penetration force that, that is needed to break the sample placed uh, on the base of the instrument uh, to a preset distance, uh, also revealed to be higher in SLM rather than in the uh, NLC. So after applying these three empirical tests, mathematical models have been used um, to analyze the response uh, of the systems to the deformation. And the aim was to show, uh, or to, at least to know, how well the experimental data fits uh, each applied model. And uh, uh, to do so, the regression coefficient, or the square root, uh, has been calculated um, for each mathematical model. And according to the obtained results, the, um, uh, for, for the regression coefficient values, the reruns of the study were better adjusted to the Bingham's model. Uh, which is typical of pseudoplastic uh, behavior uh, for, all, both, for both SLN and NLC uh, based xanthan and gum hydrogels. <clears throat> uh, so uh, these results are in agreement with the conclusion that the developed semi-solid formulations shall appropriate a rheological uh, properties for a topical uh, application. One last study uh, that has been done uh, with the xanthan and gum hydrogels uh, was the evaluation of cutaneous changes uh, on skin volunteers 
uh, over the course of the 30 days and results uh, are, are again uh, very promising. Xanthan gum uh, containing uh, NLC uh, dispersions, they improved the smoothness and decreased the rootness, so they improved the smoothness, decreased the, root, the rootness, the scaliness, and uh, decreased also the, ring, the, the risk of wrinkles in comparison, so in a higher extent in comparison to the uh, SLN and to the uh, plain, uh, plain uh, hydrogels. So we confirmed these results when uh, analyzing the surface evaluation of living skin parameters, and it is clearly shown uh, the, improved, the improvement of the micro relief here after 30 days uh, of use uh, of NLC hydrogel uh, in comparison to the SLN and to the plain uh, hydrogels. Before uh, wrapping up, um, we also wanted to see the effect of lipid nanoparticle uh, concentration on the rheometry uh, of the systems of the hydrogels. So we use the very same shear flow test, evaluating the shear rate <coughs> uh, as a function uh, of the shear uh, stress, so increasing uh, the shear stress from 0 to 50 Pascal. So increasing the uh, concentration of lipid particles from 10%, so the initial uh, formulation, to 30 and to 40%. Uh, and so this means in terms of uh, nanoparticles concentration, a huge valued value could uh, now uh, be recorded uh, for uh, both samples. So the formulation containing 30% of SLN uh, showed a yield value of 28 Pascal and 39 for the 40% uh, uh, of uh, SLN loaded hydrogels. So these results they can be explained by the fact that during the shear flow investigations, uh, NLC can come closer and uh, either NLC or SLN, so nanoparticles can come closer uh, and form a pearl-like uh, structure. So with a, with a higher resistance uh, to flow, therefore we find here uh, the uh, health value. So fin uh, f uh, some final uh, notes. Um, SLN and NLC, they have been entrapped into hydrogels based on natural polymers and after the entrapment the size of the particles can remain uh, within the nanometer range. Uh, the zeta potential values increased, so uh, we can also increase the long-term stability of nanoparticles when dispersed into these uh, uh, hydrogels. The solid character is maintained uh, when the particles are uh, inside the hydrogels. By shear flow investigations, tixotopy of the systems uh, in, in some systems have been highlighted, and after correlating the radiological properties um, with the texture analysis, we could be, uh, it could be observed that SLN and NLC based hydrogels, they respond to the Bingham model, which is uh, typical of pseudoplastic behavior of the shining uh, fanning bodies. And a final study uh, has been performed to, em to emphasize the importance of lipid nanoparticles for the creation of yield values uh, with increased uh, uh, of the concentration of lipid nanoparticles uh, in the semi-solid system. So this is of major uh, importance uh, for the performance of the uh, lipid nanoparticles uh, for both skin administration and for uh, drug uh, bioavailability. So higher resistance to flow uh, with the heel, uh, because of the presence of the heel values, a higher degree of shear uh, timing behavior uh, is due to the breakdown of the nanopart uh, nanoparticles uh, imposed by the uh, shear stress. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, many, many thanks uh, once again for this opportunity. Uh, hereby express my, my gratitude to uh, the range of my uh, team, uh, my fellow uh, colleagues from Brazil, represented here by the head of the labs uh, in their respective institutions. And I also acknowledge uh, uh, my colleagues and, and my collaborators in Coimbra uh, in Minho, University of Minho, and uh, in Porto, or University of Nantes. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, Doctor, for uh, your nice presentation, your nice time with, with us. I guess we have a problem with your camera, but no problem. Uh, I don't know what's the problem, because we can't see you. But I can hear you uh, very nice. Uh, we have for one or two questions or comments. When you talk uh, about the 
solid solid nanoparticles, lipid nanoparticles. Can you talk yeah. about the the commercial the commercial applications? Uh, yes, basically, um, the, uh, in fact, uh, uh, these nanoparticles they uh, they are uh, uh, on the market already, um, uh, and there, there is a, a um, so the market share in terms of uh, uh, lipid nanoparticles for cosmetic applications uh, and for demo pharmaceutics they do uh, exist, so they are already uh, on the market. Um, and the first uh, uh, formulation that has been uh, uh, launched uh, to the market using nanoparticles, using lipid nanoparticles, uh, was a, a placebo formulation, so without any kind of active ingredients. So uh, uh, the idea was, uh, in fact, to take advantage uh, of the nanoparticles themselves uh, for um, uh, to improve the um, hydration of the skin and the smoothness uh, of the skin. So they do exist on the market, yes. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Doctor, for uh, this talk. You can enjoy uh, with uh, Doctor Eliana Soto by Google Meet. Thank you, Eliana, again. Thank you very much. Muito obrigado. Obrigado. Hello, Diego Montovani. How are you? Hello. Uh, fine, thank you. And you? <laughs> I'm fine. We receive it now in our uh, lecture, Dr. Diego Montovani, 
the title of this lecture is the the the, the title of this lecture is natural polymers health focus on regenerative medicine. Diego Mantovani is the director of laboratory for biomaterials. Can you hear me? O professor Hernani travou. Ah, professor. É... Can, can you hear me? You You can share your screen and start the presentation. Did you see my screen ah. or not? I I see. I see. It's okay? It's okay. So I can start. I'm very sorry. We should have tried before. Eh? Mm. Uh, you can ask and and click here F five. We your screen is we need to see, we need to see. Oh, full use, full screen. Mm. Is it better now? Yeah, it's better now. Perfect. And can you listen me well? Yes. So I'm supposed to start? Yes, you can. So people are listening. So, boa tarde to everybody. So very sorry for my Portuguese. I hope uh, you can see me. Anepli, I cannot see you. I am Diego Mantovani from Quebec City, Laval University in Canada. And um, thank you very much to the organizer for uh, the invitation. I really appreciate Today, uh, I would have loved to, to be with you in Brazil. This is uh, uh, a just uh, another opportunity will come uh, in, uh, in the upcoming months or years. So today, I would like to introduce you to natural polymers for health, uh, and the uh, uh, focus will be more on regenerative medicine. Basically, what I wanted to show you in uh, 25 minutes, I would like to uh, bring you into how cells can work with natural polymers for regenerating part of tissues or of organs. Uh, basically, what I want to show you is uh, if uh, engineers from bricks were able to produce uh, big walls, why bioengineers from some cells will not be able one day to reproduce uh, a full artery. This is an arterial wall. It's, uh, it's called invaginated because um, these uh, uh, vessels generally they are stretched. So when you cut, they fall down. So basically, Regenerative medicine is based on collecting biopsy from the body, extracting cells. Uh, biopsy can be from uh, diseased tissue, from healthy tissue, can also be from um, um, umbilical human vein, so the umbilical arterial veins. So you expand the cells, so from one million you can have uh, billions of cells because each one can be multiplied by 10 and each one of the 10 can be multiplied by 10. And then basically, you can extract proteins, uh, natural proteins, 
I hear I have a collagen, you can have a fibrin, you can have elastin, you can have the mix of extracellular matrix, process all together and construct a collagen gel. Generally, this is what people do. Extract a collagen, create a cylinder and seed on the cylinders, the cells. Today, I will bring you into a parallel world and it's the world of taking materials, putting in solution, and then adding cells into the solution, mixing well, seeding, um, this means um, um, casting together, and finally recreate tubes and maturating bioreactors. So, regenerative medicine, in very general manner, concern first take cells from animals or whatever you want, take materials put materials to working world cells. And up to now, these three basic steps, there are tons of people that can do this. This is a very well process. When you want to go in three cylinders, in, in three dimension, like in cylinders, like you can see here, this is a modified cell cultures just to build at the place of placenta, cylindrical vessels. Let me explain how. When you take a natural polymer, so here is a collagen, but probably is the same for a, a bunch of natural polymers. You put in solution, so you dissolve, you recreate like a soup, a soup of proteins where you have everything connected. And you can do a lot of study, interesting study. This is an atomic force microscopy study in order to understanding the number of rings connecting in fibers of um, collagen. But when you put the cells inside and the material is recognized by cells, then something crazy happens. This is very clear here in immunostochemistry. You can see that the cell, this is a smooth muscle cells. Smooth muscle cells are particular cells, muscular, they like to force, they are energetic cells, and they like to use the network of proteins, natural polymer that you provide to them to compose like a spider on a network. And you can see here in atomic force microscopy is one cell with a lot of pseudopodia branches in all the direction. So what I want, uh, I want to start from the very, very simple with you. And the very, very simple is uh, take uh, a small tubes, in the tubes put uh, a uh, collagen and cells, and then you can maturate uh, in a bioreactor. Here, for example, is a tube where you have a mandrel inside. The mandrel was seeded with some collagen gels. So the receipt is easy. 99.5% of water, 0.5% of collagen type 1, and 1 million of cells. You put all together, shake well, and wait 500 up to 400 hours, and you see that the diameter, the one that you see here, is really shrinking, and within 24 hours, shrink of 50%, within uh, one day, it shrinks 75, 80% and then go down. We will understand what happens. This is the mandrel. This is the collagen with that you can see. So as you see, all the collagen is connecting around the mandrel. Here are cells. So cells are inside the collagen. Here is the skeleton of cells is called actin. And finally, here is a combination of everything. Cells, collagen, and the skeleton with cells. So let me show you what happens if you take pure collagen. This is a pure collagen extracted from cells. You compose a cylinders, it jellify, 99% water, 0.5% collagen. At 10 degree, it's very liquid, but at 37 degree, it becomes jelly. But the breaking is very, very fast, and it's very brittle, as you can see here, a breaking point. What happens if in the same gel with collagen, you insert one million 
of a smooth muscle cells obtained from a human umbilical vein from uh, patients who gave birth, uh, from mom who gave birth uh, to a small baby. So basically, you, have, you see, after seven days, is the same veneers, but cells completely remodeled. And there is even some elasticity when you pull and stretch the cylinders, the cylinders come back. This is much similar to, let's say, a balloon that you use for uh, children parties on Davos. And I have even something more uh, um, surprising to show you. If uh, you cut a piece of this cellularized collagen gel, you can see that uh, cells after one week, they are rolled. And basically what happens is that the materials, when it's open, it open and finally it roll alone. Who is putting, injecting the driving force for rolling? Cells is certainly not the materials. So today I wanted to um, have your attention on collagen, uh, but uh, basically you can use chitosan, you can use soja gel, you can use gels from a number of materials that must be compatible with cells. Collagen, you know very well, it's a very surprising component. So basically we developed a, a way to extract these from uh, uh, rat tail and you will extract, basically it's possible to start a type 1 collagen. Type 1 collagen is the one most present in the arteries. And what is nice with collagen is can be molded in different shapes, can be directly and uniformly cellularized, cells like collagen type 1, and eventually cells can even remodel the collagen. So basically after gelication, you can mold and you can have discs, you can have cylinders, and you can have even have uh, cylinders, long cylinders. So this is a ring and this is a tube with or without cells. These photos are without cells. So basically, let me explain how you pass to the next step. Arteries are beautiful organs where you have three types of cells working together. Fibroblast, they are the most outer, so they are on the external part of the artery, smooth muscle cells, who provide the muscular activity of artery, and finally, endothelial cells. So you start in a petri dishes to seed collagen, so with fibroblast and smooth muscle cells. Second step, you, on the top, you put a second layer of smooth muscle cells and on the top, a third layer of endothelial cells solution. So basically, you have a petri dishes with three layers, a sort of lasagna, if you can accept the, uh, the, 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 the visual idea. And basically, the external layer, the first one, fibroblast, Last as move muscles, it's uh, the <coughs> flat representation of the adventitia, so the more external layer of the artery. The second layer is the muscular layer, so more uh, speaking about the media, and the third one, endothelial cells, this is a monolayer, very thin, like a mosaic with endothelial cells on the top. So basically now you have um, a layer where you have a collagen and you have a monoculture where you have just endothelial, uh, endothelial cells monolayer on the top, collagen smooth muscles, collagen smooth muscles and fibroblast. So what is interesting is that uh, endothelial cells do not fall down. They remain floating on the top and basically after 24 hours, they are a very good stable endothelialization. This is an histology and if you look at the collagen, so the green part, look also at the point. All the points are cells. Look how cells are well spreaded, very 
homogeneously, uh, let's say the density is very homogeneous at day three and at day seven. You can even show you by immunofluorescence that the red layer, which are endothelials, is continuous and completed. So basically, we have, rep we are reprodu we have reproduced here with... Uh, not high cost and not complicated systems in a normal biotechnology lab, you can do this, a flat petri dishes where you have reproduced a three-layer vessel wall artery. This can already be used as a model for working on the interaction between the three kinds of cells that are inside. The materials, the, the, the matrix is well structured and what I call is more physiologically relevant. If you look at expression of alpha actin and caponin, you you can even see that a smooth muscle cells phenotype is in a contractile type. And this is exactly what smooth muscle cells are. So if you culture in the smooth muscle cells alone, is not the same things that if you culture fibroblast and smooth muscle cells color, covered with endothelial cells. So what we are learning is that the cytokine produced into the collagen from the three kinds of cells boost the contractile phenotype of smooth muscle cells. And in tree culture is even uh, better. So this is a first signal. When you use natural polymers to contain cells, think that cells are never alone. And generally, they work with other cell types in order to develop. Someone in the past asked me, are you crazy? You are using collagen, which is a, a not hemocompatible at all. Actually, collagen is uh, a, a thrombogenic materials, and you want to reproduce the vessel wall. This will be um, coagulated within minutes. Be not true. Why? Because we take these uh, petri dishes and we put it on the top some drop of blood. Let's see what happens. Basically, when you have a tree culture, fibroblast, smooth muscles, and collagen, you have the highest day of hemocompatibility. So the free hemoglobin is very low. And basically, the fact of having endothelial cells on the top inhibit completely the, the thrombogenicity part of the collagen. And this is probably the best results that I will show you. This is in the uh, um, extracellular matrix proteins. So basically, 99.5% water, 0.5% smooth muscle cells. Cast it together, you get uh, a flat specimen, multi-layer if you use uh, one, two, or three type of cells. And... At this point, cells will believe to be at home and they will start to produce their own extracellular matrix. So basically, this means that I providing, I am providing collagen type 1 extrinsic. Uh, this means I give. And now cells will start to produce fibronectin, fibrillin, and tropoelastin. This is a great result because tropoelastin is not something that I had provided in, 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 in my cell cultures. So this means that the smooth muscle cells in presence of endothelial and fibroblast and collagen type 1 exogenically provided, they are so happy that they will start to provide their elastin. And for those of you who know a bit uh, elastic materials in the body, tropoelastin is the missed element in collagen gel because tropoelastin provides the elasticity of the materials. Elasticity, this means the ability of the materials to be elastic. So in order for an artery, for example, to be inflated and deflated. 
And this was a very interesting results. And now let's start to go tubular. So we did this in flat. Now we start to go in cylindrical. So take a mandrel, take a tube. And finally, you, you need to put some ghost grips. If not, you are not able to remove. So you put the tube. And inside the tube, you add some gels. Let jellyfy for one hour in the gel. There are cells if you want, and you immerse these in a tube of culture mediums. And the cells that are contained in the collagen around the mantle, they will start to um, spread, uh, proliferate, and reorganize, regenerate the extracellular matrix. And look, this is a under the Reich experiment up to now. If we are not speaking about uh, buying millions of uh, Reich in, in some crazy stuff and others. So up to now, it's done with tubes. It's done with homemade people. And if you wait one or two weeks, cells will remodel in static culture the collagen. The collagen will result compacted, as we saw before. So there is a shrinking effect. And finally, something interesting is this. At the beginning, time zero, you have a diameter of 4.7 millimeters, but after one day, 60% is collapsed, and after one week, 93% is shrinked. So basically, you start from 4.7, and after two weeks, you have a thin, transparent, cellular eyes, collagen and three type of cells layer, thick 360 microns. This is not yet an artery good for your heart or your body, but this is something that you can use. And at the basics, there is the collagen. So 0.5% of collagen type 1. Starting at this moment, you can take the cylinders, you can cut a specimen, and you can do some, for example, mechanical testing. A nice and interesting way to uh, test mechanical, mechanically these uh, rings is really to stretch, to induce a deformation. So you deform for some time, and during the deformation, you will observe a relaxation. These are called the stress, stress relaxation. I will make a long history short, but basically you have the ring, you, strain, you stress, and you make relax. You stress again, you make relax. Do you know what is interesting? Is after each relaxation, the materials is improving the resistance. So these materials containing cells like to be stretched. This is an interesting representation as control, one week, two weeks. This is elastic and viscous modulus. Look how the viscous modulus is high after two weeks. So you, you are able with this way, but you don't do nothing. Cells do it. Cells are able to increase by a factor of 35 the mechanical properties of collagen and cells uh, seeded the scaffold. If we look closely, this is a scanning electron microscope. This is a ring, a cutted ring. You can see that you see the cells all are aligned. Here we are internal. You can see they are so well aligned around a matrix of collagen. And if you go at 1000, you see all the collagen fibrils around. So, yes, collagen is at the basics of this. You can do the same on a cylindrical scaffold, and you can see the histology. So, here is the internal endothelial cells. Here is still collagen. Everything blue is collagen, and the point are cells. You can see a different magnification, and look how cells in the internal side, they are really close to one another, reproducing the mosaic that I mentioned at the beginning. This is the lumen. This is the outer surface, and what you can conclude is there is a progressive orientation from the internal to the external substrate. And finally, you can go further. Now we start to go in a more advanced system. We developed a chamber 
where you can apply attention to the construct made of collagen and cells during the deformation. So no strain applied will be compared with 10 cyclic strain. So basically applying a cyclic uh, strain. But again, this is not uh, a very complicated system. It's a homemade, is a cylinder, and basically there is a small tensile way mounted on a dump that can induce a deformation. Look at static, look at dynamic, 10% cyclic, only 10% of cycling strain, so basically is not one hertz, is much lower, but look, this is the same magnification, how thinner, how more compact and dense is the is the uh, thickness of the wall. So basically, cells, if stretched in three directions, they really work harder in order to compact and regenerate the system. And uh, you can do this also with a ten cyclic strain with under mechanical properties, and you see that the strain still improve uh, again by a factor ten the resistance of the materials. One of the last point is that. Uh, now we learned to do this with one layer of collagen and cells. What happens if we put two or three layers? So at each time you wait one week. So experiments are long, but they are not very costly. They are not very complex apart bacterial contamination. So this is a single layer, double layer and triple layer. You can see how histologically relevant is these structures. If you show this to biologists, he can imagine that is a real artery. And the mechanical properties are really improving. Look here. This is one layer, two layer, and three layer. We also understood that the difference between two or three layer is not so important. So two layer is enough. We earn two weeks. And the stress relaxation result goes in the same. A triple layer is just a bit more resistance than two layers. So we will go with two layers. And now, last step, we go in bioreactor. And yes, now the experiment become costly and long, but basically what you can, uh, you can verify the contractile nature of the smooth muscle cells. And the last point is really to go in and inside the bioreactors. Let me explain here, I think it's better than and um, biological, you have one, two, three, four cylindrical models of arteries, five millimeters in internal diameter, five centimeter long, just regenerating. And you can see that D0, two days after with stimulation, cells will reorganize collagen. What is interesting for you is that uh, actually this is uh, a work of uh, PhD of Dimitria. Dimitria is a Brazilian lady in my lab uh, who is completing the PhD and the formerly uh, chemical engineer in uh, Unicampi. And uh, basically day one, day three, day seven, we, she showed how important is the density in this tubular collagen. And she understood the number of fold increasing by 20 roughly that fibrin and collagen can provide inside the tubular gel. The, the density was optimized and something important is really that we are approaching the elastic modulus of uh, uh, carotid arteries even if sure uh, our intention at this moment is not to reproduce artery into the body, but mainly to create models for 
uh, models for testing materials. So this is the bioreactors, this is the chambers. You can see that there is some uh, pulsation that you can see. This is uh, under a physiological flow. The material is, uh, is pulsing. And the idea is to go toward a physiologically like, physiologically relevant, uh, let's say, maturation. I hope I was able to show you how natural polymer and in this case collagen can be interested in a planar versus tubular models, mono B and three layer models. So sometimes it's very interesting with natural polymers that by definition do not have the same mechanical properties than synthetic properties, but they have biological uh, features very interesting. So to use in multi-layer structures. I think I introduced you very basically in a bioreactor system from the one with the tube uh, during one, uh, one week. And uh, sure, you need also to develop a different platform for, uh, let's say, characterization. So it's not for tomorrow that I think we will have regenerated arteries, but in the upcoming one, two years, uh, there are a number of cosmetical um, uh, cosmetical companies that are interested in developing strategies to use cells from placenta, so from uh, human umbilical vein and placenta, in order to reproduce pieces of skins and testing a new treatment and new very active cream for beauty and a more cosmetical approach. It's also, I personally think that is also very interesting for studying pharmacokinetics, compatibility test in flat and in cylindrical. I show you for vascular because uh, uh, for time, but I can bring you our example on skin and eventually our example on uh, cartilages. Sure that one day or another, this will be in uh, the ability to use from injectable gels. And eventually, hopefully, one day we will be able to repair and to replace surgical substitute. So uh, I hope uh, you, um, you, you you were able, uh, I was enough clear for you to be able to follow. This is uh, my team and in general, they are those who work on the bench while I prefer to present or to write. In any case, I am very open for um, comments, questions. I was indicated by the organizer that I should uh, um, join in now uh, another group um, separate. So I will be there <coughs> for the next 15 minutes up to half an hour. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any question, I will be able to take. I hope I was not too long, dear Dr. Oreman. Thank you, Dr. Mantovani. Grazie. <laughs> Obrigado. We have <laughs> we have a question here, Philippe. Excellent presentation, outstanding results. I have one question, though. Having the collagen amount of these materials are low, are there any concern, concerns of allergenic reactions? Actually, the question is very pertinent. Thank you very much, uh, um, Dr. Abitz Reuter, for uh, for uh, for. Um, for having these questions. What I missed, because I went a bit long, I went a bit fast, what I missed to say is that uh, the collagen extracted from rat tail, the nature uh, protocols indicate that it's uh, uh, desimmunized sterilized and neutralized. So basically with you, I am enough confident that one day I can inject myself with collagen. Sure that there can be some allergic reaction in some specific patient, but in general, collagen reactions are very low. And uh, I, am, I will feel confident. Sure, cosmetic companies do not like collagen from rats for cosmetic products. So they will prefer from jellyfish or from uh, more uh, interesting animals than rats. So I hope I answer. Okay, many people talk 
excellent presentation or uh, thank you Montovan for the presentation thank you caroline <laughs> are you working with uh, any solution for provide 19 or not have you ever used your polymer for uh, uh, to try to develop new uh, materials for COVID-19? I will be very honest with you. Uh, um, yes, we have a project funded by Canada government on COVID, but uh, not concerning collagen, but mainly concerning chitosan. So we are using chitosan to enwrap some low molecules of, uh, um, of an antiviral, basically a soap, and to attach this micro drop to some uh, textiles for people working in contact with COVID for improving the capacity of the materials. But uh, what I presented today it's really a bit more large, but I, I choose this for uh, the audience of this conference, mainly because, you know, this is a real need. There are a lot of pharmaceutical companies that look for models and natural polymers. You can take whatever you want, chitosan, even cellulosa, even cellulosa bacteriana. I know that there are a lot of Brazilians <laughs> working on that, yeah. but also chitosan. What is important is they are acetylation uh, degree and others, but even soja, even, and uh, these can be very interesting for uh, support for biotech, uh, biotech applications. Okay. Uh, this, the, the last question is, uh, yeah, well, Rodrigo what? from Fortaleza, okay. Okay. Ah, please. please. <laughs> What do you think about collagen extract from new source, as you mentioned, it, from fish in terms of mechanical properties? No, this is a good. So uh, the question is very interesting, Rodrigo. Thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, Professor Vieira. We work together since years. So, um, the attractiveness of uh, the uh, collagen sources other than animals, um, rats or pigs or beef, but mainly marine and from marine environment, he is not at the level of mechanical properties. It's more, it's more at the level of uh, seduction for cosmetics from a cosmetic and also you know there are some religions that do not allow uh, pork or beef and also there are some complications with uh, eventually um, uh, diseases like Ratzville Jacob with uh, beef and others. So the point to extract collagen from marine source is really in, a, in an attempt to make something more global, useful for everything. Hanepli, the mechanical properties are strongly function of the extraction process. But if you uh, put in acetic acid, basically you destroy all the structures. So the mechanical properties basically are gone. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Monto. And after the, the, the talk, we can discuss with the professor uh, uh, Diego Mantovani using the, the Google Meet room. Google Meet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.